call the meeting to order. It's 6.05. Yep. Um, we have a few amendments to add to uh, our agenda. One is an executive session. Uh, one is in the workshop area. We're going to put, a word. Jennifer and I are just going to review briefly the goals for 2019-2020, which is the sheet that was at your seat. Um, and we need to add the food service policy um, under policy. And Claire Trebeco also has an announcement, so we'll put that under community engagement and public comment. Okay, sounds good. All right. Um, other than that, does anybody else have any other information that they would like to share tonight? Oh, and Mary Beth is also going to kind of give us an update of um, where we are in communication with Reading. So we'll put that under time schedule appointments. Number four. Okay. Um, so there's our amendments. Uh, because this is not technically a business meeting, we don't have any minutes to approve tonight. Um, hello, community and public. Nice to see you today. <laughs> Do you have any comments that you'd like to make? Or? Well, my gosh, as a matter of fact. <laughs> All right, moving on. Claire, your announcement. Yes, so um, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock here, there's a group of students and um, led by Annie Luke. Do you all know who Annie is? The school's SAP, um, which stands for Substance Abuse? Prevention. Prevention, thank you. Um, are going to be presenting the most recent youth risk behavior survey data for our district, which I think is really important data to see. It um, highlights kind of what strengths our community of children have and then what high-risk behaviors they're participating in and, and what percentages of them are. And so I think anyone who can come to that, I think it would be a really important information for us to hear as board members. Um, you can also find the information online um, at the Vermont Department of Health website if you just look up Youth Risk Behavior Survey, Vermont Department of Health, and you can look by supervisory uh, union districts. Um, but I think it's, there's some stuff in it that's actually pretty alarming that we are, um, I mean, I can kind of summarize it. Okay, right. um, you know, if you look at the, the percentage of students that were offered, sold, or given an illegal drug at school over the past year, were much higher than the Vermont state average, with males at 41%, females at 21%, and Vermont state averages being 17 and 13%. So I just think that there's data in there that we have a lot of strengths, so it's not all bad. You know, our kids are more athletic, eating better foods, feel more connected to their the adults in their lives, but there's also some high-risk behaviors that I think, as board members, we need to be aware of as we move forward with the strategic plan and think about the climate and the culture. I think that those are really, that's important data for us to have um, in our heads and, and our fingertips. And where are they getting the, the statistics from? Um, the statistics are self-reported by the teams. Self-reported. Self-reported by teams. And it's school and high school. Middle school, so the, the statistics I just told you right now, that's just high school. Our middle schoolers are making really good choices. I looked at all the data today. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, there's like a separate one for middle school. Separate for high school and middle school. And that's done across the country. So it's a national um, survey that's done every two years at every public school across, and some private schools too, across the nation. And so it's a really validated, good tool that researchers use all the time to look at what the, the students across the country are doing and what, what strengths and, and challenges they have. So it's a, it's a really good tool that's been used for decades. So I would encourage people just to look online. And if you can't come tomorrow, I think it's, it'll be interesting to see how the students present the data and kind of what solutions they, they may have on their own. So I think if any of us can come, it will be good. But if you cannot come, just check it out online. And what time is um, the presentation? Six o'clock. So Mary Beth had to step out um, for a few minutes. And why don't we go into policy uh, next? 
Jim, Pamela. Why don't we start with this sheet that's just going around right now? Okay. Yep. This is the meal. What, you, what you're going to get in front of you is if you have a child already in our school, this was already mailed out to everybody by email from, who was it? Gretchen. Gretchen. Yeah. And uh, we're just making it notable that if there is a policy that's going to be taken on by the school, it still has to go through policy So before it gets sent out to the public. So we're in agreement with all of this. It is, it is a policy. And the only, for the only changes are federally mandated, so right. there really is nothing to discuss, um, but yeah. we have to go through the process. So it's a technical thing where it has to be, go through our policy committee and present it to the board for us to do a first read tonight, because this is what that is. Exactly. We had a policy, the federal came mm -hmm. in with some different changes, and that's all we adopted into this. Okay. Just as a question, because I've never seen this on top of one of our policies, the Vermont Agency of Education. Will it say that on the top, or is it going to say WCSU? It should say W. It should, it, I would believe that's going to be off of there. It's just going to be this right here. Gotcha. Okay. Right. So this is just that it's just the Department of Ed. Yeah. Get, get just, okay. okay. This is what you should have gotten in the email, quite honest with you, for the children in school. It's yep. like Vermont Agency of Education. We'll, we'll switch it up as a first reading and change it so we take the minor students and education already. Okay. All right. And then the other policy is the age of entrance to pre K and K. Um, and that's actually just a, um, there's not really a change in content from any of the schools, but we're just creating a policy for the unified um, district. Mm -hmm. So it was always September 1st for a child. If you're born September 1st or prior, you could attend, at five years old, you could attend uh, kindergarten. If you're, I believe, it's three years old now for pre-K. So September 1st would be the same. So someone that was born September 2nd or <laughs> September 3rd, you know, like what is possible, uh, you have to wait. Okay. Did you wait another year? I did. You actually were quiet and like didn't like fight it. <laughs> oh, we, we argued. They argued. <laughs> <laughs> I can picture that going like without question. <laughs> my daughter, my daughter graduated from the school last year, and it's about a year behind that we thought, but it worked out great. All right. So <laughs> it worked out. It was a, it was a good it was a good choice. And Had nothing I, to do with the high school. Can I just ask a question? Why is it September first and not a cal a, a calendar year? Like so from January to December. Basically, when I was asking that question many, many years ago when my daughter was going to kindergarten, it's just the way most of the state of Vermont schools are set up, that it's September okay. 1 is the mm -hmm. date. There are some that are December 1st. Yep. Yeah. I pulled the whole list of all of the schools in the state, and 90% of them are September 1. Okay, so we're kind of just following suit within the but state. But I think it might go way, 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 way back when school used to start after the holiday. Yeah. You know, yes. so you had to be five by the time school started. I have a question just in terms of the child that has reached the age of five on or before September 1st okay. is eligible for entrance to kindergarten but not to pre kindergarten. What if they're developmentally delayed or there's some, I mean, are there, is there room for? There's, you know, I, I read that or also. They are and ready like, for kindergarten. So, I can answer that yeah. if you want from a, from a standpoint. Uh -huh. So, the way the agency of education in the CDD writes their universal pre K mm -hmm. Act 166 is they have to be three or four by September 1st and not eligible for kindergarten. Okay. Yeah. Therefore, if they're on an IEP or if there's something in that they've gone through the process and they need to be held back for, okay. you know, well, well, specific reasons, out. then that makes them eligible. <coughs> Or if like my child was born on September 1st instead of September 3rd and I wanted to hold her back, I'm sure you can go to the school. The only kids. thing that comes into effect is if they're five and the parent wants to keep them back, you can't access the universal pre-K funding. Okay. okay. But they could attend the pre-K. They can go to pre-K if they want to pay the tuition. There's just no universal pre-K funding in that instance. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just had a question about the the student that comes in later in the year, let's just say somebody moved here in October and they decided they were going to move in October, so they didn't register their kid where they were and then come here. Um, 
Do you, uh, did you ever see, foresee that being a problem? Like, oh, we, we know we're going to move in October. We'll just register the kid when we get to, well, to we Woodstock to go to school. Like that with another parent a uh, year before May. Uh, no, I mean we've uh, had we have, at Killington. We have had several issues that, that I've dealt with as a board. I mean, we had you know one parent whose child was born after we said no. They put her in a private school for. A I'm talking months. about the moving into the district. No, no, but, oh, so, but if you yeah. move. It, Maybe just to clarify, yeah. Penny, I think what you're asking is so if somebody came in on October 1st, could they enter? Yes. As long as the child's birth date was... Uh, but, but they weren't registered for kindergarten where they were. Because that the way I'm reading this is if they weren't registered where they were before and then they move in, that they can't register here? Am I reading no, that wrong? No. The, as long as their birthday... Is, if they were to move in up. in October and their birth date was prior to September 1st, they could is there a sentence that's confusing in that way, Patty? There's a sentence in there that says, say say they lived in Arizona and they were admitted to kindergarten as a four-year-old. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. And then sense, they moved to Vermont. Says, it says a child who transfers into the district at any time during the school year may be considered for admission to kindergarten by the superintendent provided the parents were not legal residents of the district. Okay, so they weren't here and they decided not to yeah, register. Right, the right, but the right. second one says the child has been registered and enrolled in kindergarten in the district in which his or her parents were legal residents. So like so, I mean, so you would have had to have been registered where you were. But yes. Yeah, so my, my scenario was just like if somebody knew they were moving in October and they didn't register their kid where they're mm -hmm. coming from and then they come to Woodstock. They have to live well, by the they have to live by a, they have to go through a whole year of not letting their kid come to school. Correct. I would hope that they were in touch with well, yeah, yeah I, and I, I'm just, you know, you, you always, policy becomes a problem when you have that, that right. little exceptional situation that seems. So the way the policy is written up, the way you're reading it is, is that if a child is in um, kindergarten and was four and a half years old because they accepted, you know, and then moved here, the school would be able to accept that child in the kindergarten. But if the child was not in kindergarten and came here and was four and a half, they have to live by the rule of September 1. And then my, my only other question was, I, I know this is an age of entrance policy. The kindergarten policy specifically talks about legal resident of the district, but we don't talk about it in the pre-K. Do we need because any kind of... pre-K is universal. You can live anywhere in the state of Vermont and go to any pre-K in the state of Vermont. There is no district boundaries. Yeah, but in terms of priority, you're not... There is priority to people who live in district, right? Right, so the way that we've been working it is that we open up registration pay, um, a month or so, mm -hmm. and we open it up for us. When they turn three, they are automatically transitioned into a pre-K program. So that would be a circumstance under which a child would enter. It, it's, it's not a specific date, it's the date of the birthday. So that would be a time in which... But that's if a child needed special services. That, that's transitioning from um, early intervention into a pre-K program. Okay. So that's one example. Um, if we have a child that moves, that is interested in coming to our pre-K mid-year and we have space, 
it would seem reasonable to me that we would we would take that yeah. that student in, um, much like if someone was moving into a district. Um, I, I don't see the downside to that. No, I don't either. I'm just wondering. I mean, doesn't this policy say we can't do that? Then? We I would think not receive universal pre-K funds if a child turned three after September 1st, and if they turned three in December and you wanted to let them into the program, there's no universal pre-K funding for that. The Agency of Education Act one the so Act 166 states they must be three so, or four. So basically, like this policy is really written up by the only thing we did was pick a date and we stuck with the September one because that's what the school already had. It was already all written by the state, and we just stayed with September one. So a parent though could pay if they had a three year old and wanted to put them in the preschool to pay for. Them? Yeah, I mean, what we might want to think about in terms of amending this is that if a, a pre-K student wanted to enter past, past the, the start of school um, and they are no longer eligible for universal pre-K dollars, they would have to pay that amount of tuition um, in addition to the regular tuition. pre-K experts <laughs> on uh, double checking I've learned a lot about pre-K in the last year. I think that would be a whole board deciding if we really wanted three-year-olds and number or whatever you know, in a preschool. Well, we have three of them. Well, three years old after that. Generally, that we have it. Some pre-K too. Yeah. So. I don't have any three-year-olds, so I'm not worried. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be important decided. to get feedback from the yeah, it's, that's, yeah. That's, you know, find out yeah, how the preschool out, yeah. teachers are with the, I mean, I would think that would be a um, child by child situation, right? Yeah, the other way that we could do that is um, leave it up to the, super, the discretion of the superintendent mm -hmm. and then I could talk with the pre-K teachers, is this something that would make sense? And that would be another way to do that. Um, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I would like to go back to our pre-K teachers and yeah. talk to them about that, so I'd be prepared to come back to our next meeting, letting you know their feedback around that. Yeah, and I would hope that the process was, if it was, that the child comes in and meets up with the school and the teacher mm -hmm. and everything else. And yeah. Make sure I think it's, it's worth, though, exploring, because, I mean, the point of all this is to make preschool accessible to kids and to working parents in particular, and so, like, you know, there may be a lot of kids who are a good fit at some point during when they turn three. And I mean, if we have space, if we don't have space, we don't have space. But if we have a space, I think that we should entertain that. Could, so. could I um, propose <coughs> that perhaps, very best, you get that information from the teacher and bring it to the next policy meeting? And then that yeah. way, we at the next board meeting, we can discuss it again. Maybe we can propose yeah. a new yeah. sentence or something. Yeah. Because yeah. then Maybe. a child would be in preschool for what, three years? Yeah. Um, so that's another. That's yeah. Because if, per, if the child is born, say September third, okay, and it doesn't meet that, so they're putting them in preschool when, so now they're three at September third, they're four at September third, <laughs> they're five at September third. They really can't go in until they're six on that September f or the August whatever. So it's three years in preschool. And just let's make sure that that doesn't get fumbled there. That. Just because you're putting it early, you're not going to be able to get into kindergarten after two years of preschool. Lots of kids who do that. Well, then I wish I would have known because my kid was in preschool before she was. Yeah, you know. Anyway, if we could look into it, Mary Yeah, I will do that and I'll bring it to the policy committee. Look at there's So then, do I have a motion on the table um, to move these two policies for age of entrance and food services to a second reading? So moved. A second. second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Um, so we just get the pre-K. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to go to pre-K now. Um, one of the things I wanted to um, respond to the board's request that I take a look at what is the possibility of opening up a second pre-K at West for next year. Um, I had the opportunity to sit down with um, Principal Maggie Mills. Um, we went over kind of what the options are, and unfortunately, we're, we're somewhat limited for next year, and there's some, some really, quite frankly, technical questions that are limiting, uh, li well, there's technical and there's space issues. So the one thing that you should know about pre-K is that it, it is an amazingly regulated program. <coughs> 
the Agency of Education, but from the Agency of uh, Family Services as well. Um, and every pre-K classroom space needs to be licensed before you can put kids in there. You have to set it up as a pre-K classroom. They have to come in and look at it. There, it, the timeline is just not there for us to get a space to actually be licensed for next year. Um, the other thing that we looked at is what if we added another teacher? Could we accommodate more students if we, we did that? And the current pre-K classroom space is licensed, but it is only licensed for 20 students. Um, and, and factors such as square footage and child to bathroom ratio are some of the things that go into that. So we can't add any more than 20 students in there. Um, <coughs> And so, the, and we do have a situation where we have private pre-K programs in that area, so there, it's not like students would not have an opportunity to attend a pre-K program. Um, and if the board so chooses, we could certainly look at how we might add a second pre-K for the following year, but for next year, logistically, <coughs> that would be a really significant challenge. We could do that on the budget. Yeah. Find out the cost and everything. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, can you just update us on communication for the Redmond School and yes. the community? Yep. So what we have done in accordance to kind of the timeline that we've mapped out is that John Hansen, who is the principal at Reading Elementary School, has sent out a communication to families outlining the, the, the plans for how kids will tra transition and as those events become closer um, then they'll be, you know obviously get more details in terms of this time or this, this um, start date or whatever it is but he has gone over in terms of visits to Woodstock Elementary School um, a number of different things and I, I don't have the communication right in front of me but that went out to family members um, so that they know that there's a plan in place and when they the, the approximate timelines that all the events will occur. Does anybody have any questions? Yep. Is there any further information maybe starting Reading at a normal time? With the, I know that there was a whole bus <coughs> issue. I find it terrible that we do this to the people in Reading. Especially if you have two kids and one kid goes to Reading and now one kid is going to go to Woodstock next year. I mean, my kids are not even out of the house at whatever time you start. I don't know how you do it. I commend you. I think that we were going to look into uh, what it would take for the buses because I don't think <coughs> it was a situation that we were definitely opposed to. I think it was more what, right. how does it affect the budget and how does it affect the bus situation. Yeah, I think for all of the things that Reading parents have now gone through that it's not a terrible thing to ask that they start like everybody else just because there's a bus issue. I mean, I, I, I don't live in Reading. I don't know what it really is like, but I can just imagine. And I just, I don't know. I don't think it's fair that just because you live in Reading means you have to start your kid at 7.15 in the morning or whatever it is. Well, I, I think that's how everybody felt after the last conversation in the last meeting. So Richard was going to do some research on it and then okay. report back to us in our next business meeting. Business about meeting. That. Yep. Awesome. Um, and, and then we can decide as a group how we want to proceed with that so that they okay. can either get that new timing set up for next year or continue on the timing that they've adjusted to over the years. Helena? Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. But how long has Reading started school at 7 in the morning? As long as my kid has been last two or three years as long as my kid has been. I, I just was wondering. Um, and then I, I imagine the feedback is, is that they would like to be at a later time. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to make sure that that's something that... Raina or Tim, want. do you know how long they've been going earlier? I want to 
going to say a minimum of two years, possibly three. Oh, yeah. No, it was not that. Okay, okay. So it oh, five. so it wasn't always three. that. <laughs> no, it became, That's what I a, to know. it became okay. a response to a busing. A busing oh, issue. A busing, yeah, there was. Okay. Was it a busing thing or was it a reading budget thing when the elementary schools were separate? Uh, I believe it was a busing. I mean, I, I don't know, but maybe it's when we thing. have our next business meeting, we can find out can, why they yeah. why they moved to that <laughs> schedule. Because yeah. they, they share at the high school middle school, it's one bus that does everything. The kids were sitting on the bus waiting for the high school middle school bus to come down for like half an hour. They were just sitting in a pull off. At so the bottom of Reading Hill. At the bottom of Reading Hill. So if they started earlier, they could dismiss, drop off all the kids, and then go meet the bus. Because if they start earlier, so prior to the two earlier? years ago, when your kids were on the bus, they would pull over for a half hour. Is that what you're saying? And then I mean, I've been with yes. the central office for almost so the bus five started years. The and when my kids were there, that was the problem. Okay. So, the so the bus was always doing that. It's just instead of saying school starts earlier, the bus was pulling over to the side for a half hour. Right. For, the for so yeah. and, there, and there it's was issues been with some kind of issue. Yeah. There was issues okay. with the okay. sharing, sharing the sharing yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I would rather see them in the building than sitting on the side of the road. Yeah. Yeah. The other small, just related issue, like so, when it starts at seven fifteen for kids who take the bus, that means like they're getting out of the house at like mm -hmm. six forty-five. Yeah. Or Early. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we'll report back at our next business meeting on what our options are for busing and what the costs would be involved, and then we can discuss how we want to move forward as a full board. Good? Okay. Um, all right. In our <coughs> workshop tonight, um, all of you got this board work 2019-2020. Um, Jennifer and I kind of sat down and, and talked about what we thought really needed to be accomplished in the next year um, and it's it's goals that we we have for the full board it's goals that we have talked to Mary Beth and Sherry and Raph and Richard about um, it's goals that are going to help keep us moving forward from um, just strategically from a curriculum to administration end of things to also um, projects um, keeping on us on track of really kind of putting the foundations in place on certain projects as well <coughs> and also um, having discussions um, before we need to have the discussions that would affect the budget process um, because we feel that over the last two years especially with a really large budget um, as well as a very large board, we've been more reactionary to our conversations, especially involving the budget process. Um, and so I think sometimes there's an intensity and anxiety that starts to develop, and I, I would like to try to alleviate that over the next year so that we can start having these conversations and in our next meeting after the discussion, you will be able to ask follow-up questions to things that maybe you didn't understand or maybe it didn't make sense to you or you know maybe Mary Beth needs to follow through on certain things that she didn't have all the information that we thought we would need to make that decision to move forward in the process um, this is something that can be ever evolving it's it's not set in stone it's more we need it to start somewhere to start the process um, we did sit down with Mary Beth Sherry and Richard for about three hours to start working it into the calendar for the next year. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly go over this. I don't really want to get too much into the weeds of it, but just give you some ideas of what we're thinking about so that you all know where our heads are as your co-chairs. Um, so board work. Uh, currently, the policy committee is working on grading policy, class configurations, and school viability policies. Um, if you have questions about policies and where they come from or would like to suggest a policy that you don't see that we have currently, 
please contact the policy committee and ask those questions of them. They will usually have those answers and be able to help you out. And we're meeting Monday, next Monday at 1 o'clock over at the SU on item 1 and item 2. Who's on the two? Obviously Janet and Pamela. Um, the two of us and Lou. And, Lou. and Sherry. And Lou Piconi and Sherry Susan. Okay. Um, then we start going into mission statement, profile the graduate, strategic plan, and accountability for the strategic plan. So those things all kind of go into one category. And as I said when we started doing the training, is we as a board need to start taking more ownership of this mission statement, the profile of the graduate, strategic planning and accountability. Our real jobs, a lot of this groundwork has been done. We have already voted on the five cornerstones to support the profile of a graduate. Um, Mary Beth has worked tirelessly with, I don't know, a hundred plus people on starting to put together a strategic plan. But we as a board need to not only own the profile of a graduate in the strategic plan, but we also have to now start talking about the mission statement, the preface to this whole introduction to this new thought process that we are going to be adopting over the next year, um, as well as really sitting together and saying, well, how are we going to know that everybody's been accountable? You know, once we set the strategic plan, how do we then look at the accountability of that strategic plan? So those are some of the things that we're going to be working together on over the next couple weeks, and at, especially at the June 1st retreat. Um, Jennifer and I are going to start to um, put together some ideas for prefaces and mission statements and maybe some ideas of how we can look at accountability based on the statistics that come out of our testing and other ways that Mary Beth and Richard and Sherry and Raph will suggest as well um, so that we don't come into the retreat just cold but we have some ideas that we can bring forward to you and then we can work as a group to elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, budget and budget presentation. A lot of the presentation, discussion, and action items will affect our budget. Um, we want to be more proactive in these conversations um, because obviously a lot of these things affect the budget and the process of the budget. Um, I'm going to go on from there. Superintendent review, we've started the process with the contract um, with um, FASPA. Um, so we're moving forward with that process. We will keep you up to date on the input that we need from you as our board and her peers as well. Um, think about future leadership. Jennifer and I are going away in 2021. <laughs> we will be taking about 30 years of experience away with us. <laughs> so we want you to start looking at this group of your peers and start thinking about who would you like to see as the future leaders of your organization? Who do you think could help lead you in the future? Who do you think is somebody that you want to work with in developing that future? Start thinking about those things because we would like to, over the next year, year and a half, to help train those individuals into those positions because there is a very large learning curve. I have always said, usually you sit on a board for six years, not just three years, because it takes you about three years to kind of get what's going on. And once you get what's going on, then you start really having true conversations and input into a conversation. Um, so think about that. We'll start asking questions of you in, in maybe putting people's names forward in the next three to four months. But I really think that it's a process that we should take seriously so that we can start training those people. I have been to trainings through um, VASPA. I, Jennifer and I are going to Lake Maury for a day seminar with Mary Beth. Um, so there are things that we have over the years attended 
and I know that there are other chairs who have attended chair trainings as well and we'd like to get people in that loop um, presentations and discussions uh, we've, we've talked about the new loop partnership um, at our next <coughs> business meeting Mary Beth will just <coughs> update us on the contract as well as uh, Jennifer and I got a response from our council on the question that Jim had asked us about signing a three-year contract we will have those answers for you soon um, the after-school program is presented to us in our next meeting um, some questions have come up about guidance versus counseling how does that work together how does it not work together Mary Beth will be making some suggestions for our future um, we are asking to hear about the athletic program and where do we stand with the athletic program and what is the cost involved in it how many teams do we have um, how do we buy uniforms etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, grade and campus configurations obviously that's a topic that is being discussed currently in our next meeting we will have a presentation from Bob and Bryce on um, from Lee. Lee Sherwood, yes. And then will you be making a recommendation for campus configurations or is that later on? Um, uh, what we'll do is we'll bring we'll bring to the board what we have recommended. Okay. On this yeah. on configuration and on school construction. Correct. Okay. Um, middle school, high school administration configuration. Um, Mary Beth has suggested that we look at hold on a second I have my notes somewhere organization. thank you an organizational chart throughout the entire district so we have an idea of what our organization looks like um, start talking about curriculum director K through 12 one or two do we need a pre-k to six and a seven through twelve or are we going to be looking at one curriculum director <coughs> um, I was looking at just learning more about traditional learning versus project-based learning because that is new to me as a parent um, so I thought it would be educational for us as board members to understand um, what that really involves because we're doing more project-based learning within the schools there's more independent studies now um, with some of the upperclassmen and so on and so forth so I'd love to learn more about that and I think the whole board should be more involved in that not in the decision-making process of it but just the understanding of what that means to us educationally um, and then reports and data uh, we want to get pre-k enrollment and costs we want it to look more closely at the lab classrooms and costs and our coaching um, that will start taking place uh, July 1st uh, we will be getting a report on summer soak um, as well as food program and its enrollment and costs uh, obviously not only are we going to have an athletic program presentation but also kind of where we are with the program enrollment costs etc cetera, etc cetera. we will get an update on the middle school high school curriculum director and and what she's accomplished over the last two years in particular and what her goals are for maybe the next year because she has a I think it was a three-year contract that so to speak she and she's actually on a teacher contract with the staff. okay um, we also have asked to see the STAR and SBAC results as well as PSAT, SAT, and where kids um, from this last, from this future graduating class will be going off to college so we can start looking at those results. And then projects um, are more foundational projects. Um, one is to put together a policy handbook so we have that at our hands, at our fingertips. The other one is a procedural manual, which is for then the administration and teachers to back up the policy handbook, correct? Yeah, that, so that's like student handbook that goes out to families yes. both at middle school and high school level as well. So. Yep. And then the third thing that Mary Beth um, suggested was doing an annual report, which was really reporting back to everybody on how we're doing, you know, kind of like a business annual report. Um, but also sharing it with 
our taxpayers so they know how we're doing too. Um, and I think that's an excellent idea. She will show us an example of some annual reports that other schools have successfully um, done. I think it was very impressive. Um, I think it would be really fun to see that happen and come to fruition. Um, on the second page are just kind of some odd topics that have come up over the years. Class trips, field trips, um, funding them, sports fees, busing for sports teams. It's not consistent across <coughs> the board. Um, the theater program, is it an extracurricular program? Is it a curriculum program? And then uh, the last one is adulting classes. Um, some of us has talked about, you know, preparing our kids for leaving the school. Um, I actually came across a really great article online where some schools are now starting these one-day seminars for seniors. Um, one day every semester, which is called an adulting class, and you can select different topics if you so choose, you know, from putting your taxes together to opening bank accounts to how do you buy a cell phone and set up an account, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those are some kind of just off the cuff ideas. Um, I think that as we move forward over the next year, obviously um, one goal, at least for Jennifer and I and Mary Beth was um, it'd be really great for the communications group. Um, I am actually gonna call the owner of the Vermont Standard and see if we can get a regular uh, I don't know, article in there every single week. Um, just like they do in Bridgewater and Woodstock and Reading, you know, reporting back to who saw who over the weekend and what pies were made and so on and so forth. And it's fun to read those, but I think that it would be really nice to have, um, you know, a Woodstock, a, what are we, Windsor Central, uh, district report or something on a on a regular <coughs> basis um, it can range from principal reports to Mary Beth doing a report to us doing a report as a school board but I, I think getting something out there that's regular and very consistent would be really fabulous and I don't think if we were writing the articles that the paper would really object to that idea so do you want the communications um, yes. to put together I would to love that. that. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Because I'd like to move on to Mary Beth's presentation. I'm wondering if at some point someone could send out a list of the committees and who's on them just for us to do. Yep. Board members so we have a Yeah, I can do that this week. Bob? I, I don't know whether this is a appropriate list, but um, being in conversation with EJ at the Union Arena, so we're trying to get the MOU revised oh, okay, and updated yeah, yeah. so it's pro there's probably at some point a report out on or a and we have that meeting scheduled right yeah may yeah. second and they even given us a budget yeah. okay mary beth the floor is all yours oh. so hopefully folks have the copy of the, the draft strategic plan. I know, Raina, you've got some extras up there. Um, and this evening, the uh, goal is to both familiarize you with what um, our strategic planning design team has, has come up with and vetted with us, um, and then to get your feedback um, on ter in terms of what you're seeing and questions that you might have about the document. Um, so, let Raph plug in here. Yeah, I don't believe <coughs> And just be before we get started, this is a working document, so you'll see that. We, we still have different kinds of photographs to add. We have the thank you page, we have the glossary to put in. The, um, the board has a placeholder where we will be taking your picture. 
for you. So, uh, perhaps the May 6th uh, so reading fair warning. So, yeah, you can come here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, there will be a, uh, a letter for the board. <laughs> Oh. And so you'll see that it's it's not completely done, but it, you, you're getting a sense of the format and what it and the So I thought this evening, before we d jump into the content, and I'm, I'm not going to go strategy by strategy because I may bore you all to tears if I do that. You have the document to look at. There'll be an opportunity to ask any questions you have about any strategy, but I'm going to try to give you the, the big picture of what it is that we're trying to create. The, um, the other thing that I will let you know in advance is that one part of this plan is learning environments that has to do um, primarily with facilities. Um, and because there is a focus <coughs> on that in a sixth meeting, we are not going to address that part of the project plan. Okay. So starting with why, and again, just kind of remembering why are we doing this? And as folks know, we, we've been doing a lot of work in terms of identifying what does our portrait of a graduate look like. Um, and we'll spend a little bit more time in the retreat, taking a, a deeper dive, really unpacking this to make sure that the, the board really feels comfortable speaking to this and asking any questions that it might have as you are our ambassadors to the community. And it's important that, that you're feeling comfortable with, with this concept. Um, so one of the things in our, our graphic here is this idea of inspired locally and prepared globally. And as we think about the strategic plan, one of the things that you will see all over this is that there's a lot that, we can, that inspires us locally, from our natural resources to our community resources to the individuals that are um, within, our, within our different communities. So there's a lot to be inspired locally, that this really is and can continue to be a destination area. And so when we think about a strategic plan, we want to think about how do we capitalize on that. Connected to that, we also want our students to be prepared globally. Um, and we talked a little bit about this last time we met in con conjunction to the New View Studio. So you remember the slide about student A and student B and those additional skills that now become more critical in this global environment. Um, communication, collaboration, creativity, um, critical problem solving. Um, just gonna kinda continue to flood you with information about this. This is from the Word Eat World Economic Forum. Um, the top 10 skills that employees <coughs> need. Um, and again, if you take a look at this, what you see are these skills that we're talking about. Those 24th century skills of complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, um, judgment and decision making, emotional intelligence. We talked about the service economy. This is um, a, a document from the XQ project. I don't know if people are familiar with that, but there was a, a nationwide grant program that we're, we're giving schools in the area about $10 million to create a vision of, um, of innovative um, high schools that will really meet the demands that, that nationally people are seeing students are going to have to face. And they talk about the old paradigm and then what it, what's needed in the knowledge economy. So you're looking at follow in the old paradigm, you follow order, you follow directions, you co-create plans to achieve goals. Product driven versus customer driven. Um, climbing the corporate ladder versus seeking the leadership op leadership opportunities. I, I was speaking with a gentleman that does a lot of work <coughs> in Europe and he was saying, you know, when I first started in, in this work, when new people came into our company, they were expected to be quiet, you know, take it in for a couple of years before you start kind of promote. And he said, today, we expect people to hit the ground running, they come in and they're contributors. Um, so lifelong employment, to changing job, uh, job offer, jobs often, thinking resume versus a LinkedIn profile, um, commutes to office, works remotely, um, domain specialization versus agility across domains. So th these are the kinds of environments that we anticipate 
um, that students will enter and the skills that they'll need. And just keep putting these out here. This is, you know, job projection in terms of service economy, what we see happening for jobs that are related to those interpersonal skills and working with clients. Um, see, I believe you've seen this one again, non-routine, critical kind of problem-solving tasks. That's, that's the blue line. And then non-routine that is related to, in, um, to interpersonal activities, right? So not, but that's the, the fastest growing trend line. What isn't growing is non-routine manual. And what's actually declining is things that are, are cognitive in nature, but they're routine. Because those things are being taken over by artificial intelligence. So when we think about our kids, this is the world. These are the kinds of opportunities they're going to face. Are we preparing them for it? Then when we look at this, we, we put this idea of inspired locally with all of our amazing resources, getting our kids prepared globally. And then we take a look at what's happening in the state of Vermont. And if you take a look at this, one of the things that you'll see is states with expected decline. Um, Vermont is actually below the bar in terms of projected growth. That as, as a state in this nation, we are one of the few states that is seeing a, a, a decline in terms of growth. Vermont and Alaska are tied for last in payroll percentage growth, and the only states with negative growth. And Vermont is the second oldest demographic state, and it is my understanding that in 2018 there was one live birth. So when we're thinking about a strategic plan and we're thinking about uh, attracting people to our areas, we need to understand that but that's another reality that we go with. So our strategic plan is, is designed to create the kinds of programming that will make our students future ready. It's, it's also designed to draw family and businesses into our member towns, ensuring long-term viability, and to build a new definition of community, right? Prior to the merger, we were towns, yeah. and thinking about <coughs> us as a full community um, with a shared vision for where we're headed. So turn and talk for just a quick moment. <laughs> and I'd like you to discuss this question. In your opinion, what are the most compelling reasons for a strategic plan? Discuss. <laughs> 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 Thank you. to talk to our communities about why, we've, why we're putting a strategic plan together, the, the why of this work. So I'm curious kind of what thoughts came up as folks were discussing. Change is inevitable, but growth is optional. Yes. Mm -hmm. So things are going to change, but whether you decide to grow with that change. What they are in the making right there. <laughs> 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 Good. Any other thoughts that came up as 
knowing what direction you're going and doing it thoughtfully. Right. Well, yeah, if you don't know where you're going, it's unlikely you're going to get there. Yeah. Do you think that some of the reasons that we kind of outlined here, do you think your community members will find those compelling? Are there any other reasons in the, kind of the why that you think would be would particularly resonate with your folks in your community? I don't know if it's a why. It's it's how and what what you're actually trying to do with the strategic plan. That that's my main concern. I'm obviously going to get talking, and you know, to me, when I look at all that information, yeah, I mean, it's known Vermont. The kids are leaving Vermont. There's not jobs here. There's nothing that a state, that there's nothing that the school can do about that, okay? Because the school to us is more of educational, and how they get that education should be the strategic plan, mm -hmm. not the. You want to kick in here? I think. <laughs> you know, um, not, not the not the not the kicking in of the. Um, you know, this. Who cares if there was one child born in Pomfret? I don't. I. I don't even know why that's because they could be two kids born in Killington, but there may be 20 families that move there. I'll kick in. I think what we were also saying is that it's important to consider the conditions, mm -hmm. very important. Um, but we think a lot of people, including ourselves, would like to see a little bit more of the education focus in the plan, the, on the academics, on that sort of aspect of growth, and, and not veer so far into what starts to seem like job training. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I was just going to say, if you look at the data, um, at what are economic drivers for communities of really fantastic schools, a huge economic driver for communities. So I actually think that this is really germane in terms of the reason why a strategic plan and looking at your school um, <coughs> from head to toe, top to bottom, is really important because that is an opportunity to attract more people to our districts and therefore reverse some of the trends that we are seeing I think and the point about people being able to work remotely I mean every week I'm seeing more families moving to our area because their parents can work remotely the parents can work remotely so they can choose where they live now and they can telecommute to work um, but a lot of the time they want to see a really well all the time they want to see a really good school system they're choosing to live somewhere and to work remotely. So I, I, I do think that these things are are relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think going back to your question and being ambassadors for you know people in the town, it's this having a strategic plan sort of you know it's a it fuels our decision making process. You you know having this and and saying we can go back and say well this is what we're doing, this is our strategic plan, this is why we made the decision for this budget item, this is why we're doing curriculum this way. So if we're all on the same page, then we can talk about things in the same with the same language and explain them in the same way. So Yeah, so that, that kind of clarity when we get to decision making, oh, <laughs> what, it, what, it, what did we say, what was our plan about? Yeah, so good, kind of a North Star in some yeah. ways. Yeah. Okay. So let's unpack um, some of the big ideas here, and um, and this is the more the how piece. So jump in here with any comments or feedback. Oh, can I just jump in one sec? Um, just to let you know, after our training meeting, uh, Jennifer and myself sat down with Mary Beth to review this, um, and we had made some suggested changes to the draft. What, that was the first original draft and now I think this is maybe draft two but I want because we heard feedback from all of you saying we do as a board need to have more skin in the game so to speak within the strategic plan and so we made some suggested changes they weren't major but they were just how would they be received from the community from the parents mm -hmm. from the kids <coughs> looking at it from a different perspective than an educator or an administrator and looking from a different perspective than the people who are involved in putting it together and coming together more as parents and board members. So I did want you to know that we did do a pre-read with Mary Beth and the team as well. 
Um, so one of the kind of thoughts to kind of launch this, se this section is a quote. There are many persons ready to do what is right because in their hearts they know it is right, but they hesitate waiting for other fellows, for the other fellow to make the first move, and he in turn waits for you. So one of the things that we, we think about in this particular section is how, how are we engaging our children and our students in making meaningful contributions in the world and learning how not only, not only what is important about what you know, but it's important what you do with what you know. So the first goal is related to the portrait of a graduate. All students will be empowered to make both local and global contributions through the attainment of the skills and dispositions outlined in the portrait of a graduate. And this is strategy 1.2. It's a big idea. Um, but this is to review, refine, and where necessary, establish stewardship experiences so that they are well planned, purposeful, and integrated into content and grade level curriculum. So I'm going to show you this, this brief video. Um, I will share with you that it is a, an inner city example. The rest of the examples I have are more, um, probably more relatable to Vermont. Uh, but I think it does a really nice job of talking about this question of stewardship and what is it that we mean when we're trying to grow students that are stewards of their community. Um, in this particular piece, I, one of the things I would ask you to look at, um, because we'll, we'll talk more about the academic piece in goal two, but in this work, where, where are the academics? Um, as they're being stewards, <coughs> they're also engaging in high-level academic rigorous work. So watch it, and then we'll take a quick conversation. What if students went to school with a mission, not just to get smart, but also to become a better person and contribute to a better world? School could be a place of <coughs> compassion and courage, a place of hope. My name is Amira Rollins, and I am a high school student in Chicago. My neighborhood has challenges. Poverty and violence make life difficult for many families, but I have a privileged life. My privilege does not come from money or safe streets. My privilege comes from having attended a school with a different vision of what is possible. Our test scores are good, but that's not the most important thing. Our work is beautiful, but even that's not the most important thing. This is what is most important. We work together to get smart for a purpose, to make our community and the world a better place. Let me share with you a story of what that looks like. It began in seventh grade with an in-depth study of the U.S. Constitution. At first, when we read We the People, we didn't connect it to ourselves. But over time, we realized that in a democracy, a government by the people, for the people, meant us. We were the people. If we did not stand up for what we believe, who was going to do this for us? My classmates and I worked with our teachers and school leaders to take on a serious problem in our community, gun violence. Hundreds of incidents of gun violence occurred right in our school neighborhood. And 96% of students in my school personally knew a victim. <coughs> what can a group of middle school kids do to address such a serious problem? More than you might think. We met with families, community leaders, legislators, clergy, and police. We researched the lives of local peacekeepers, members of all these groups who dedicated their lives to keeping and spreading peace. We celebrated those life stories in a book we wrote ourselves, professionally published and shared nationally. We created public service announcements that were shown on television and viewed by leaders of Chicago. I want to be a professional dancer when I grow up. I want to be a doctor when I grow up. When I grow up, I want to be a police. We organized a citywide day of peace. On this weekend day, we asked people of Chicago to put their guns down and work together in a sweep and greet. Meet your neighbors, clean up your street, share music and food. Did we succeed in creating a full city-wide day of no violence? We did not. 
but our part of the city, a good portion of Chicago, had zero violence the entire day, perhaps for the first time in history. I'm in high school now, but the middle school students of Polaris Charter Academy are keeping up this work. And here is something hopeful. Polaris is a part of a national movement. The EL Education Network includes over 150 public schools across the country. I'm going to stop it there and just talk a little bit more about the <coughs> organization they're part of. But that's what we're talking about with stewardship, is to take a community issue, whatever it happens to be, and that is, that's compelling to students, that they want to shepherd and steward. And steward. Um, and if you looked at that, I don't know if people saw some of the rigorous academics that were there, but they were unpacking the U.S. Constitution. They were publishing pieces um, in a book. They were interviewing uh, community members. You know, we saw the green screen there. Um, they were creating um, PSAs <coughs> and uh, um, messages for their community and learning how to post that. They were organizing an event with lots of project management type of thing going on. So while they were doing the stewardship work, they were also engaged in some very rigorous academic content. Um, and when we think about stewardship in our plan, we've talked about the idea of steward of yourself personally, steward of uh, the local community, and then steward of the global community. So this idea of being a steward <coughs> So strategy 1.2 is around this <coughs> idea of reviewing, refining, and where necessary, establishing stewardship experiences um, that are well-planned, purposeful, and integrated into the content area, right? So it's not like we're going to do our social, we're going to look at our social studies content and then we're going to do stewardship activities. They're actually integrated into the content Strategy 1.3 is related to having middle school, high school students have at least three opportunities to empathize with a client and design solutions that reflect an understanding of a client's need. <coughs> and an example that I would share here, this is actually from um, Stanford Design School, so our Stanford University. But just to give you a sense of what this could look like, this is a project that kids in Stanford are working on right now, the future of farming and technology. Um, they, they're asked to imagine how you're going to feed <coughs> X million people by a certain year, and that national policymakers are looking at this, um, Silicon Valley is looking at this, academia is looking at this. Um, and then they actually put the kids out on a farm where they start to create solutions for other for farmers for their clients and then as they are creating their solutions they're presenting to their peers who are also engaged in farming work and they're designing solutions that can be applicable <coughs> for a, a certain client population um, again not in absence of content right but looking deeply in terms of what's, what's the history around agriculture? What do we learn about agriculture? What do we know about um, plants and environments and biology? That all those things get integrated in. So I, I would argue that in terms of academics, when it, is, it is not that we are not asking kids to engage in rigorous academics. In fact, I would argue that when it's done well, it's some of the most rigorous academics kids can be involved in. Um, and, and so this work is, is something that I do think pushes academic excellence. Um, and, but it, it engages kids and students in problems that are real that they are, they are working to solve for a real world client. Um, and if we have all of our high school students have at least three of these opportunities where they are, they are given a client and a problem, then they, they're prepped, they start to get a practice in doing the kinds of work and the kinds of thinking and building the kinds of skills we saw in those opening slides. Um, 
Then, let's see, in strategy 1.5, one of the things that we know in terms of building some of these skills is that the practice of reflection and revision is where we see growth in students. So how, when, I, when I attempt to do something, whatever it might be, I'm going to purposely step back and reflect on how I did and what I learned from that experience and then go back and make revisions so that I can improve upon my product, whatever that happens to be. So strategy 1.5 is through adult modeling um, that we really start to build that culture. Um, and I'll, I'll give a, a brief example. One of the things that we did this year as, a, as an administrative leadership team is that we put a survey out to all the teachers and said, tell us how we're doing. And then we sent a report out to them to say, this is what you told us. Here's, here's what we're doing well. Here's what we need to work on. So that we build that open culture of let's talk about our work together and how we do it. Right? Let's, and feedback is welcomed. Um, so that's part of the strategy in 1.5. So a couple other goal one strategies. Um, designing and implementing performance tasks or capstone projects. Um, so some may ask what is a performance task or a capstone project. So a performance task is a, 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 a challenge that you give to students in which they are asked to exhibit all of the characteristics of a portrait of a graduate. So that's our outcomes. We're designing a, a task that kids would have to complete and through that completion, they are exhibiting the fact that they are they are learning these portrait of a graduate skills. Um, we are also looking to design and implement a K-12 digital citizenship curriculum. Um, a digital citizenship, I, I don't know if people are familiar with that term, hence the glossary that will be coming. Um, but what that means is helping kids to know how to navigate in a digital environment. Um, <coughs> there, yeah, there are rules around how you engage safely in a digital environment. There are rules around self-monitoring in a digital environment. So for example, oh, I noticed that I didn't get my homework done and instead <coughs> I spent three hours on whatever. Um, so noticing that, teaching to that, um, those kinds of things. What is the difference between an email or communication you send in a work environment versus a friend environment? So getting kids to be savvy around that. What is your online footprint, right? So when somebody goes to Google you, what does it say about you? Are you being proactive in building a positive footprint for yourself? All of those things are integrated into a digital citizenship curriculum. Um, and then finally, connected with the, the piece that we saw earlier to provide targeted, sustained professional development around models of reflection, critique, descriptive feedback, and revision. Uh, and to support implementation of these models in our, in our classrooms. Okay? If we're graduating students that are constantly reflecting on their work, that are taking in feedback and are able to revise their work as a result of that feedback, we are graduating all the parent kids. Um, goal two. 95% of students will matriculate into a post-secondary learning institution and will dis demonstrate a success rate in this environment that is above state and national averages. So there, there's a two piece to this. One is that 95% of students matriculating and postgraduate post can be a four-year university, a two-year university, and an apprenticeship experience, but that they are just not, not leaving high school for <coughs> additional training. Um, and that we, but our goal is not just to get kids into programs. Our goal is to ensure that they are well prepared so that when they are in those programs, they are successful. Um, this is the uh, most recent data from uh, National Clearinghouse, and we are in the process of gathering actual specific data to our district um, that, that goes through the same system, so we'll have some good um, Windsor Central data coming up. Um, but currently, in a four-year public college, notice that they don't, they're not even tracking how many kids graduate in four years anymore. They are now tracking how many kids graduate in six years. Um, at nationally, 66% of kids will graduate 
kids that start will, will graduate in Vermont, 78. Vermont is one of the highest percentages in the country. However, it's still about a quarter of the kids are not graduating. What and happens? Not a quarter of the kids actually go to university? Yeah, so that's the, the number of kids that are actually going to so university. It's 100% that I know. So this is. This no, no, no. Is that becomes 100%. And then 78% right. of them finish. Yeah. Right. So if the hundred for if the hundred percent of students that enter a four year public university, seventy eight percent finish twenty twenty two to nine. Mary Beth. Yep. I'm sorry. What is our um, percentage of, of students moving on? What are our graduate seniors? What is the percentage of them moving on to matriculating? You know, that, that data has been a little bit all over the place, which is why we are partnering and contracting with National Student House data so that we can get really good data on that. Um, it does vary from year to year. Um, I would say where, you know, if you're going to average it in a broad range, you're probably around 70%. Okay. Uh, this is so it's public college. This is private college. Um, at, actually, in the private colleges, Vermont is below the national average. Um, and you can see that in these situations, when you're when kids are heading off to college, a quarter of them don't finish, right? and a quarter of them, that's loans, that that's putting kids in a really difficult situation. So this goal is not <coughs> just about we're going to get kids into these colleges and universities and experiences, but we want to be sure that they've got the right skill set so that when they get there, they're, they're successful. And I can share with you, I've had the opportunity to speak to a number of different um, university presidents and people from the provost office. And I can tell you that, that, what they will that what they will say is students don't almost never make it because they didn't have the right content. Students have difficulty because they have challenges with the things that are important to graduate. Self-direction, communication skills, critical problem solving. Those are the things that trip kids up in a um, in a situation. Right. Um, Two-year college graduation rates. Um, actually, can you, I actually need to take this off. Sure. Sure. Okay, thank you. So I think, again, Mary Beth is just presenting more of the data around the percentage. And actually, Ralph and I were looking at the data today in the process of writing our continuous improvement plan for the state. What we were looking at is, and kind of our summation from looking at the data over the last 10 years that was provided by our guidance council. The variation goes from 63% to 80%, but the variation can change 10 percentage points per year. And what Ralph and I were talking about often is the cohort. And the kiddos that are doing, are achieving the two and four year, um, they call it continuation, uh, right, are those kiddos that we would predict, no matter what the educational environment, they would be going on to college and they would be successful. So the question is for us, what are those skills that are lacking or what can we do to make sure that once they leave here or once they get into a program, they can be successful? First generation students are the ones that the data is the most concerning. <coughs> Raph and I were looking at, and I, I don't have the data on top of my head, but it was pretty concerning that the number of those kiddos that have, have never, families have not experienced college, have a really hard time making it through in those six years. So, um, And so the strategic plan is really talking about what are those skills that are deficit? How do we ensure that they have them? And, and what can we do differently, programmatically, instructionally, that really make a difference? And I think one of the pieces that notice about this, is you'll notice the percentages are really different than the four-year graduation rates. Like so, so a third of kids, approximately, end up completing two-year programs. So that's a lot of kids who are going into two-year programs who aren't completing that. And those are students who have debt pieces. So this is part of the reason why we want to look at the National Student Clearinghouse data for ourselves and to see where we stack up with our students compared to that. But there's a really striking difference between 32% you know, versus 70-80% of students. And if you don't complete, complete I'm sorry. Okay. I was just going to say, <laughs> oh, she's back. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's good because I mean, Raph and I were having this conversation <laughs> today. Yeah. I have a question for Raph since you're giving numbers here or whatever. The 32 percent, 38 percent, and the other one, 74, 76. I mean, we're here for our school, and you know, you're breaking it out: private, public, and then two-year. I mean, how many kids graduated from high school last year? 
here? From here. Yeah, it was probably around 80 or Okay, so then how many of those moved on to a four-year college private? How many of them moved on to four-year yeah. school public? And how many of them moved on to two-year? Um, and we are in the process of collecting that data, but I can tell you, I don't anticipate it's going to be very far off. Is this? It's concerning. Yeah. No, I mean, to me, th these numbers truthfully mean nothing to me unless it's broken down to what this school is. Because also Sitting, Paige, on, and Tim, sitting on, I think that's it, that was on the, pre oh, Bob, you were on the previous middle school, high school board, that, you know, that school, you know, there's a lot of kids that are going to Hartford or Heartland, I always get the two messed up, they're not moving on to college. So, you know, this whole idea of well, getting kids ready. Well, the Hartford Center is very strong in terms of preparing kids for course, first time. Yeah, but there are a lot of kids that, you're, you're saying here college graduation, and I don't know if these numbers are from some federal or state or whatever of college graduation. There could be, it could not, it may not have kids that move on to technical schools or whatever. Yeah, well, one of the things that we, we I were, just want to have that verified. That it, it's a, it's a really data. good question, and we were really struggling with, all right, how are we possibly going to collect this data about what happens to our kids when they, they graduate? And what we, we have is the answer to kids that go on to two- or four-year schools, because this National Student Clearinghouse uh, covers about 99%, 99.5% of colleges and universities, and they actually will track our kids and let, uh, let did they transfer, did they? Did they graduate from the transferring organization? So we have this ability to, through the National Student Clearinghouse and a partnership with them, get some really good data that we haven't been able to have before. We are in the process of going and contracting with them to go and get the back data and then get it, keeping it going moving forward. Then that gets our pool to kids that are engaging in post-secondary experiences that are not, that wouldn't be part of the uh, National Student Clearinghouse. And that they can sit down to a reasonable number where we can try to be more personal in terms of connecting with them. Um, so what, what we're trying to show here is that, and again, I, I completely agree that our, our home data is going to be the most important piece. But what I can share with you is I, I don't think you're going to see massive changes here. What we see, you know, is that we, there are large numbers of students that go on to these programs and are not successful. And that our goal, and, and, I, and I can tell you that I, in my last district that I worked on, you know, we, we had incredibly high levels of kids <coughs> accumulating into college, and we're very proud of that fact. But then we started asking the really hard question about how did they do when they got there? And we got some data that was hard. <coughs> and so when we're thinking about this goal, our, our, our goal, what we want for kids is not to get in there and get that acceptance letter. Our, our goal is for them to get into those environments, and when they get there, they're well prepared, and they can be successful there. So we're, we're kind of merging those, those two things. So um, back to Jim's question is obviously you took the information that you were able to find that was <coughs> as relative to the topic as possible. The topic is college graduation. Correct. Um, when do you think that you can report back to us on more the relatable information from really here in the fall? I, I, I don't I actually think we'll have it before then. I would say by the end of the year we should have it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I would say you'll probably have it before you have to vote. Okay. Um, so that's some of the, the data that we see around kids <coughs> and um, completion. I also want to call your attention to the fact that if you look at what happens in terms of earnings, um, for um, students, depending on where they are in terms of their training. So not only do you have much higher levels of unemployment of students that have less than a high school diploma <coughs> or only a high school diploma, salaries are much lower. And as you go up the scale, not only are you um, improving your financial outlook, but you're also improving your ability to find a job. So that, that's another piece why we, we're looking to make sure that kids are getting some kind of post-secondary experience. Um, so a couple strategies to highlight here. 
um, ensure that all students by the beginning of the junior year have identified at least two viable pathways to a post-secondary education program. So when they start their junior year, they have already said, okay, one viable pathway would be this, another viable <coughs> pathway would be that. So we're having our kids start early and really starting to be self-directed in terms of their, their future what, decisions. What does that mean? Is that mean, like, would one viable pathway be, I'm going to apply to college? I mean, is, or is it like the specific colleges you want to apply to? Or is it just like, I want to go to college? Or I yeah. want to have this kind of job? Yeah, you know, at, at this point, I, you know, I would say that that's going to need to get fleshed out by the people that are building that. Um, and I, I think it could be any and all of the above, you know, I could, I could go to um, this kind of program in a college or that kind of program in a college. I could look at an apprenticeship or um, something else. And I would guess, you know, as many things, that's going to be differentiated by students. You know, we have some students that by the beginning of their junior year, I am prepared, I am interested in being um, a doctor, and I know I want these schools, and uh, and then you have other kids that are like, oh, I don't really know, and so maybe for those kids, the pathways Why are, hey, let's look at the, you know, two-year college route and the four-year college route, and maybe state schools versus, you know, so I think that those will be the kind of work that would need to get flushed out, but what's in, and that would you know, in each of these strategies, there will be owners of the strategy, like, okay, who's going to take charge of this one? Um, and those folks will get down to those types of details. I think it'll be interesting, too, just relating back to some of the sort of goals we have for the year is to really um, help the board to, to see the role of guidance versus counseling and what we offer at this school so that we sort of really can understand who who's the point person for students on these issues. Right, and you know, one of the things that we talked about is there's a, a differential between a, a counseling department and a guidance department. So a counseling department is a, a group of individuals that are um, skilled in terms of helping kids through the different um, interpersonal, intrapersonal uh, challenges that they have. Um, and a guidance department is more in terms of, okay, what does your future look like? So we're really taking a look at structure. So uh, do we, are we doing both things well? Is a, a question and a goal for us. What do we have now? Um, currently we have a, a single office that's considered a counseling department. Okay. Um, and so looking at that and say, is that the right organizational <coughs> structure for that? Uh, but we, we don't have a delineation between counseling and guidance. So the point. same personnel who are helping kids like navigate friendships are the same people who Oftentimes are... Oftentimes they're doing a lot of the and, 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 and there counseling. may be people okay. and that are may have some specialization, but in a structure we, we don't separate out this is the group that you go to in terms of college planning or future planning, and this is the group that you go to in terms of helping with some of the emotional challenges that you might have. Um, so that's a question that I think we need to take a look at. Isn't it true though that the students are the ones that are using the counselors and all the to their to so their benefit? Or so so a, like a student class, like I'll take you know maybe one will be going in for habits or friendship or whatever. But um, you know I've known my two daughters that ever gone through this or ever used the counselors for and had a had a, a target and use the counselor for. I want to go to this school. I want to be this. I want to do that. Right. And I'm just picturing they, the and skills. They that's being really different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or they really did. You know. So, but but if your child and I'll agree, if your child doesn't know what they want, then it's more of you're on your own. Right. Do you have someone that focuses on career counseling? So that specializes in assessments. And understanding labor data and labor market. Yeah, we're really not nationally. built out at that point. It, it, we're not we're not there yet. But that that's part of what is behind this kind of work. A um, whole bunch of other um, goal to strategies. Um, a couple of things that I, I want to pay your attention or call your attention to. Um, one of the things. Paige, you had mentioned is that like kind of adult classes. Yes. Um, 
what we're thinking about is having kind of a future focus retreat or workshop for all seniors at the beginning of the school year, prior to the school year starting, um, where they're really immersed in, okay, you're about to enter the, the world out there. Let's, let's do some deep thinking about what that, that looks like. Um, we, we know that we need to identify systems of support for first-generation post-secondary students. Um, and one of the pieces I heard, um, I know Pam, you and Jim were talking about, is this question of you know, academic rigor, rigor and content. And what you see here is the, a full um, curriculum review across the district, pre-K-12. Um, and that looking at it, not just, all right, let's, let's just look at math, but let's look at the integrated subjects. Let's look, let's look at STEM, and let's review our curriculum, let's review our outcomes, let's review how we're gonna measure those. So th this, this strategy 2.6, it's, it's a two-year cycle for STEM and a two-year cycle for humanities. That's where we're digging really deeply into our content and our academic rigor. We're aligning them, making sure that things are set up in the way that they need to, to be. Um, so I wanted to call your attention to that. Um, and I, I also wanted to um, identify, uh, we were talking about how do we benchmark our kids not only against state and national guidelines, but internationally, right? Because we know that kids are going to be entering a global environment. Um, and I believe that we made a couple of the adjustments here that may not be, that's in your document that may not be reflected there. But this piece around getting really clear about our curriculum, um, and that again, when we talk about curriculum, we're talking about what's being taught, and we're talking about how it's being taught, we're talking about how we're assessing it. So that it, it is, it is a, you know, it looks like just all of the other strategies, that's a major lift. It is very connected to the question that you raised. I think that the data teams also get into that. You know, Thank we've, you, yeah. we've been using STAR data as our new assessment tool. So it's not just to identify students who are struggling, but to find those who really <laughs> have strong competencies, but we may not see them using or accessing those in the classroom. So it's really giving us a really detailed, targeted picture of all our students, where they're at, to make sure that we're really pushing them and engaging them where they're at in terms of their understanding <coughs> of content. So I think that that data team piece and Ralph's been really significant in pushing that is really going to give us good information about all learners and not just those who are struggling. Great. Um, so now what we'd like to do is collect your thoughts and feedbacks on goals one and two. And Sherry, would, it, would you be willing to be the recorder? Um, and any thoughts that or feedback around these goals that you think, actually you can type right in there. Oh, you want it up yeah, there? Yeah, that'd be great. We could just have it all in one document. Any, anything that you think is important for us to capture here? I have something. <laughs> um, I, I think it's really great to look at ways and, and to create a plan for creating more opportunities for more students that want to and can be college bound to be so. Um, but I, I think that we, we need to be realistic about the exploding cost of college and what really a national crisis it is. And so when we look at like a chart that shows that they'll make more money, but they all might also go you know, into debt mm -hmm. a quarter of a million dollars. So right. um, I, I, I just, I always advise students about graduate school saying, you know, be realistic and be responsible because this is, this is serious. You could spend 25 years paying off a loan. Yeah, and I, I think when you look at like that senior that senior piece at the beginning of their senior year, that workshop, you, you, you make an excellent point, and it's it's really important that uh, that our students understand what they're able to manage financially. And, and so that is a part of the yeah. sort of right. So and kind of so what? So part of the decision making may be, you know, yeah, this sounds really cool, but you know what? I'm going to go two hundred thousand dollars in debt there, so that's not the decision. Right. These are some other options, and what you know, what we're attempting to do <coughs> is to start these conversations early with kids so that they can be thinking about it, like those pathways as early as junior year. Is that a viable pathway for you? What would that mean financially? So I, I agree with you, and I think you know, again, one of the things like the worst thing that can happen is for a student 
to go to college, accumulate eighty thousand dollars in debt, and drop out. Like that is not a good thing. Right. And we, we really are trying to be purposeful and planful to the extent that we're able to prevent kids from getting that situation. It's a real concern again. Yeah. Okay. And I just also wondered about um, for the plan when they're junior to come up with uh, two viable paths or however that was phrased. I mean would they be able to say, I'm starting my own business? It's not an it's not a educational plan, but some kids are ready to do that. Yeah, and so then the question would be, so what kind of supports might you <coughs> need to do that? You know, do you need a mentor? Do you need a friend? So that those kinds of things, I think, certainly would be part of the, the planning process. And you know, one of the things Paige was referencing earlier tonight was kind of that map for next year. And what we are intending to do once we have a voted on strategic plans, we'll come back to you with these strategies and we'll say, okay, mm -hmm. here's what it's looking like. Here's what we're finding. Here's, here's our reporting out on that. I also think, and Richard and I have talked about this at great length, but one very different way to put us on a map would to be building an endowment that would help our seniors pay for their college educations. And, you know, most private schools today have incredibly large endowments that <coughs> help families in need who cannot afford to pay a price tag of twenty-five, forty, seventy thousand dollars I think that we should be seriously considering setting up an endowment, a very large endowment, if we could do that. And, and that, I'm telling you, would start attracting people to our district because it means that we're serious about supporting our families and these, co and these kids who are potentially going off to colleges. Um, I don't know how you raise that money. I am not a, a, a fundraiser, but I, I would think that organizations, very large organizations that focus on future education of our kids would really <coughs> think seriously about that because we would be a very different type of public organization, public school that did that for our kids. I, I just want to. Jim, no, we'll, we'll go around you. Yeah. Oh, Jim. I want to kick off of what you just had said, Paige. I mean, you know, first of all, it's taxpayers' public money. So, uh, you know, I don't know how a, a public school is going to be able to do that. Uh, a child that wants to move on to college, if their families do not have the money to send the child to college, a lot of these colleges have endowments that will, will take them in and knock the price down dramatically. But I'm just sitting here smiling because one of the suggestions that I had last year was is that we pay for children, any child, doesn't matter if you have a dollar, your parents have a dollar in the bank or a few million dollars in the bank, but we want to push our kids and drive them to AP classes because that's what's going to get them into school. And here we are, we voted on like, and, and, and we haven't done anything yet. We're talking about one AP. We'll pay for one AP from ninth grade through 12th grade or whatever. And I mean, if you want to push it that way, once again, I'm going to say that, you know, I don't, know how, I don't know how we're going to, I don't know, for one. Right. For one. But that's a start. Yeah, okay. But I mean, I think, I think the next step should be moving to going to full out because putting money aside for sending some kid to a $70,000 a year college is it's just not going to happen. That's all. I was just going to say that I really like goals one and two when you asked for feedback. I think that they're really forward thinking and exciting and I think really in line with, I mean I'm not an educator, but I, I've been trying to research kind of what education looks like nowadays, what does pedagogy look like nowadays, and I think this seems really data driven in terms of the direction that the educational philosophy currently is and the, the future of educational philosophy, so that feels really exciting um, and I just be the only other thing I wanted to say was that it being in the room because I was one of the people on the strategic planning committee and I just wanted to emphasize that um, the, pe the people in the room which were you know 35 of us um, all representative of the different communities were really excited about the boldness of the goals and when you guys initially kind of 
funneled people's feedback and came with a first 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 draft um, people in the room felt like it wasn't bold enough so asked you guys to for example people said no we want 95 percent of our students to matriculate it so this came from the communities that were present um, at the strategic planning table so i just think it's important for everybody here to know what that process looked like you know, I think as I hear this dialogue, I would, you know, it would be great if we had an endowment consent skill. I would much rather see this counseling guidance piece strongly corrected and, um, and have any student that feels, um, you know, that doesn't understand how to navigate the process and their parents don't understand how to navigate the process to capitalize on every financial opportunity. And if we, you know, if we had a system in place to give that to students, I mean, that would be something that would draw people here because, hey, they found, you know, $75,000 for my kid to go to school. You know, I want, I want to go into that district. I think that would be a, a huge beneficial investment for our students' futures, for the ease, you know, for, to ease the burden for parents trying to figure out how to do all this. If they, don't, if they can't afford someone to go to, if we had somebody in the system that, you know, was really up to date on that kind of stuff that, and, and easily accessible for people. That would be a, a huge, valuable investment. Sorry, I don't want to do all the talking, but can I make one more comment? I was just thinking about, um, Jim, your comment about the APs and how important those are for getting into college um, and enrichment opportunities for students who do desire more of a challenge. I wonder if we could highlight that as, as one of more clear. Well, we're talking about, about it. Yeah. Just, you know. okay. In the plan itself? Yeah, just in the plan itself. I wonder if, if that feels like something that's missing in there under. I, I'm just asking. I, I that think could be you have to that, right? Oh, me? No. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I was just going to piggyback on everybody's and add um, curriculum design and how important I think it is to really think about the curriculum directors in the lower levels into the higher levels. And we talked about traditional versus uh, project-based learning and now there's a big drive into blended learning and there's a lot of technology that goes into that and so seeing that go into the 21st century skills I think would be amazing and really needed and so yeah. yeah. yeah and one of the things that Paige had mentioned this idea of an org chart about how we actually separate that out when we get to the foundational systems piece you'll see that that's actually listed as a strategy so all right. Awesome. Thank you. Can I say just one more thing? Sure. I think that um, I really like the idea, maybe not just for seniors, but you know, there's so many kind of like you know, so many of these critical these skills, we, these 21st century skills we talk about, are are real life skills that hopefully are taught by a skillful teacher who's able to incorporate them into a science curriculum or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. but. There is, you know, then there is just place for, I think, where we talk about financial literacy or, you know, X, Y, and Z that, we, that our kids need to know how to do. And you know, I mean, there isn't room in your curriculum. I mean, you can't take a class of that your junior and senior year. You can't waste one of your classes taking something like that. But they're crucial. And I wonder if there isn't, you know, I like if there isn't a more creative way to put that into the curriculum where it isn't making a kid, where it's not making it a whole semester class that a kid has to take, but where we identify eight essential things <coughs> you know, that we, eight, eight day courses that kids could take, you know, that junior and senior year, we could, we could pull four days junior year, four days senior year. I think it's great. Yeah, like the, uh, that adult you, I don't know if you've seen like the Hour of Code where that's like a, a national movement to um, give immerse kids like for several hours in one day and just what is it like to be a coder, right? Yep. So, you know, I think what I'm hearing you say is there's a immersion day around financial literacy or something like So some of those more abstract skills that become really They're crucial important. and there isn't room in the curriculum, you know, I mean, kids don't have time to take a whole semester class on it, but I think, you know, it's certainly, could be something we could do creatively. 
And, you know, and one of the things that you do find, in, and I and I agree with you, I mean, particularly financial literacy, if you look at that idea of like a single employer for your whole lifetime of pension, you don't need to know a lot about what you get, but that's not what this world is looking like. Um, but also, when we're looking at some of these, you know, stewardship projects or authentic learning environments, there's also oftentimes a place for financial managers. Um, and, but the t and I'm not going to limit just limiting it to that. Yeah. But I, I hear what you're saying on that. Anyway, some I, of these kind of drop-in classes. It's right. a great idea. Really quick, really quick, just I know on the college end, you hear about it as, as incoming freshmen, they're seeing they're seeing the lack of skills come in, so they're addressing that with certain short courses or yeah. pre-orientation courses yeah. that are geared towards time management. So I'm sure that that data exists out there as to how kids are arriving at school, either you know, whatever that is, two-year, four-year, you can probably take that data so back. Garner, garner some of that and do some of these mini courses types of I think you have another hand up over there from okay, Bridgewater. Right, yeah, Bridge, yes. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I have a seventh and an eighth grader, and they have. There's there's no reason why some of these things that you're saying we should start talking to our children who are in their junior yeah. year. There's no reason why they can't start being. I mean, they have study halls, yeah. and supposedly they're doing homework, which I don't buy. <laughs> um, but you know. There's free time that they have where they could pick up some of these things. They may not be fully in, in depth for what you want, but they can start thinking about them. If you want our children to start thinking about going to school, what you're going to do by your you know junior year and have a couple paths, you know there, there's an opportunity right there for your study halls. Make it into a class, you know, where some of these things can be presented. Because I I would like my kids to not just sit around a study hall. You know, these are great ideas that they can maybe absorb. And it's time where they're just sitting idle. Yeah, so I, I, I hear this kind of life skills piece as being really important. So, yeah. so Mary Beth, mm -hmm. go back four years ago. <laughs> Proficiency-based, and you were not here, okay? Mm -hmm. Proficiency-based learning. Everything that I'm hearing is here is supposed to be what the state of Vermont has told us in proficiency-based learning and graduation requirements. It, we were supposed to have counselors or guidance, whatever, and they were supposed to meet up with every single child and parent starting at a certain grade. I think it was eighth or ninth grade. Ninth grade. Ninth grade, okay. I have not been called in yet, all right? Um, and my daughter will be going into 11th grade next year. There, you know, there was supposed to be feedback. There was supposed to be showing you what you need to do uh, if you're going to go to college or if you're going to be going into a trade school or, I don't know, if you're going to be unemployed. I guess that's one of the choices, which is not a good one, but it is a choice, okay? And it's just like, here we are, it's four years later, and all I saw, and, and this is me basically, is that we've been talking about the grading instead of the implementing of the, the actual system that might actually work better for the child than... No, I mean, this is... A, a, I mean, it's I really... And I appreciate your frustration having done this for lots of years. It's something I'm, I am very frustrated with right now, and I think we need... And it's why we put it on our list of goals for this year. We really need to look... And, and I think we did, through the budget season, have a little glimpse of what's going on in guidance and counseling, you know, and what to, you know. Oh, I'm not just really putting this on one department. No, 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 this no, is no, a lot no, of no. teachers. We're supposed to be collaborating. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that what we are looking at here, we need to look at. One we have people that are working on all of this, and I, I, I we have good people working on all of this. Um, but we, we, we don't have the, I would say we don't have the right structures in place yet, and we don't have it working to the level that we would like to. Um, but so you know, it, yeah, everything is a continuum, and you know there are there's progress being made. But we see this, and it's come out through our processing with um, different groups, with the strategic planning design group, with the um, the ways in which we've collected information that we're not there yet. We, and we and this this entry into the strategic plan is a a piece to say, okay, let's focus on this. Let's make sure that we get this right. So that those I'm just getting at. 
by ninth grade, you're supposed to be contacted by a counselor and have a sit down with your child. That's pretty simple. That How come that does not happen? That does not happen. You know, that's what's frustrating. That'd be a great goal. If, it, if it's not happening, let's make it a goal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let us let let us. What the next step to this, like I said, is that we would we would be assigning people to these different strategies. Like, okay, you own this. This is the date, and then then to Paige's point, on our calendar, and you board are going to hear about how we're doing with that on the ex board meeting on this date, so that there is a there is an accountability process built in where you are, are going to be expecting and should expect a report back from us on how we're doing in terms of saying what we, we say what we should. Um, learning environments, we're going to hold that for the next meeting. Um, so next is Community Alliance. Goal four, each, at each grade level, students will engage with and contribute to the local and global community in a way that is thoughtfully and purposefully integrated into the curriculum. Um, we have tremendous community resources here. Oftentimes what happens, however, is people say, I have a great program, I'd like to come in and, and share with your kids. And that it's not well integrated into the learning experience. So what, we, what we're saying is, we want to have these local and, and global resources in our classroom, but not as a, hey, can we come in for a couple hours and do this? But this is the, the big learning objectives that we have, and this is how your, your wonderful resource can integrate well into it. Um, the next one, and this is, this is bold, um, is strategy 4.1, establish a second high school campus based <coughs> on a school within a school model embedded in a community organization or business. So we're not talking about going out and, you know, building any kind of new facility, but taking advantage of um, a, a, a resource that is in the community and, and having our kids have a school within the school out off of the campus. <coughs> and I, what I've connected to here is an example. This is actually at Burberton in uh, Manchester. They have a mountain campus seminar um, for this for the semester. They go up and they they they're examining a, 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 an essential question. And for them, the question is, how do we live well in this place? And during the semester, they're looking at the social, political, economic, environmental issues <coughs> that are impacting their <coughs> area. Right? They look at artists and how they artists have been inspired. They're looking at biology and forest communities. They're looking at uses of land. They're looking at how to prepare and lead outdoor exhibitions. So for that entire semester, they're immersed in this really big question. And it's done at a, at a site that's off campus. So we would be looking to say, you know, which of our many community resources would want to partner with us where we can give students the option of having a really deep dive in a semester experience. So that's that particular one. <coughs> um, another one is to foster and grow international partnerships to ensure that all students have a variety of opportunities to engage with global partners <coughs> and experience learning environments outside of the United States. So we talked about this last week, but <coughs> we are, in, as part of that New View Network, um, Kelvin Side Academy, which is an independent school in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, I just actually got an email today talking about how do we start building that out? How do we continue to foster the amazing exchange programs that we already have? So looking to have our, uh, to be really purposeful in giving students opportunities to interact, collaborate with global peers. Um, some other examples, we have a community connections program <coughs> currently at the middle school, high school, that's, that we've got some staff that's dedicated to having kids get out in the community, engage with the community. We'll be looking to extend that pre-K through 12. 
to develop a co-op class. So before a student goes out into a co-op experience or an experience in a work environment, um, some of those kind of professional skills that they need. You know, how do you email? How do you introduce yourself? You know, all, you know, all those pieces about how you dress and show up on time and all that kind of thing. Um, so looking to establish an externship program, which would mean our, some teachers could go out in sabbatical and deal with, you know, live in the world of work. See what that's, you know, continue to bring those real world experiences back. Um, <coughs> and um, a, a couple of these others are more just kind of a, a procedural types of things. Um, so this, this goal, goal four, is really about building out our alliances with the community and taking advantage um, and being inspired locally. Um, culture. Uh, students will cultivate a sense and will be empowered to have a meaningful voice in school communities. This was certainly something that the Strategic Planning Feedback Group told us. Student voice matters and we absolutely agree with, with everybody around that. That being sure that we are giving opportunities, intentionally giving opportunities for students to participate and hear their voices heard. Um, so in each school, developing a student structure that will allow opportunities for student leadership um, and incorporating meaningful opportunities for students to engage in district-wide leadership. Um, this is a, just a, a piece around agency. It's a, one, of the time, one of the ways that you often hear student voice talked about is to have a sense of agency. So I'm gonna give you a quick look at that. that we've been talking about that 
to gain in our students, um, and I just it's it's exciting to me to think about for our students. Do you see a, is, a, is this a progression? Do you say at each grade level, students will engage with, with, with the local folks? So is there is there like a progression starting in sixth, seventh? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think that it, it very well could be. It will will have to be, right? You don't just step into these experiences. Mm -hmm. What I what I would say to you is that these these are the concepts that would be building out then the person that's assigned this responsibility is going to start to map out, okay, what does this look like? Um, and a, an example I would give you um, is uh, something like around student discourse. What, I, what, I, what I've seen in other districts is, you know, in fifth grade you'll say, okay, give your, your neighbor feedback on their writing piece. And if you haven't been building that skill <laughs> of being able to give really good feedback on writing, that's wasted time. Because so anything like this with stewardship, there, there has to be a, a thoughtful progression where kids are building upon what they've done before. Now exactly what that progression is going to look like, Bob, I don't, I don't think we know yet, mm -hmm. but yet that concept of a progression, absolutely. I can see where, um, having gone to San Diego, when the, s the entire school's culture is around project-based learning in total, then the whole culture is, uh, and we, collectively came back and said, well, this is not, this is not totally us. But in terms of some of this engagement, it just seems to me there have to be ways, and you may do this already, I'm not here in the school on a daily basis, but to bring these kinds of projects, you know, to, to the fore, to the front. Because um, otherwise it seems like it, it could be something that is ongoing, but not part of the culture. Does that make sense? Yeah, that that it's a you know that that's part of what we do, right? We're we're reflecting, we're looking for ways in which we can contribute. Um, we're we're expecting, you know, and we're expected to do rigorous academic work while we're doing that, right? Um, so I, I do think the you're right. It gets embedded into an, an entire culture. That revision reflection is part of that culture, right? Sure so if I'm going to be doing this kind of deep work and I'm not reflecting on how I did it's not going to go real well. And if the adults in the environment are doing that, it's not going to go real well. Um, so yeah, I, I think all of this, it, it kind of forces us to look at culture and like that risk taking and that kind of thing. Claire? I was just going to say, like with my pediatrician hat on, what excites me about these goals is we know that what are protective for teens. First of all, it's really, I think, in alignment with, with, where, <coughs> with where students are developmentally in terms of a desire to have some autonomy, to have some control, to have some meaningful experiences, to feel like a meaningful part of your community, all of those things, and also to not be sitting down for long periods of time. Um, but I think when we also look at what are protective factors for young people in terms of reducing high-risk behaviors and meeting long-term potential, belonging and mastery are really important skills and or important experiences a sense of belonging and feeling like you have mastered something so I like that this kind of allows students to naturally as a part of the curriculum feel like they belong in the community and feel like they're mastering um, tasks so to me that feels like a really powerful way to actually change some of the culture stuff that's going to be highlighted tomorrow night at the getting to Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say, I was also, um, like Sam, excited about the school within a school idea. Um, and I, I work at Farm and Wilderness, which is an experiential oh, education okay. organization, and that's something we talk about all the time. How can we get kids over to work on the farm, learn how food systems work, and things like that. So I know, you know, there's probably many organizations that would be interested in partnering. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely think that we will, if anything, have to be selective because there are so many opportunities that are out here in our really rich community resources. All right, that's, oh, I'm sorry, Elena, and then we'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I see a lot of potential for project-based learning in some of these, for like stewardship um, opportunities. And I was wondering, um, it, for Bob's question too, is I, I don't see all the teachers doing this all at once, mm -hmm. and it's not a, an easy skill. 
for, for teachers to do and also for, t for kids to learn. And so is there going to be some professional development for teachers? Yeah, ab absolutely. And one of the things <coughs> that I, I, I just kind of quickly, there's a procedural piece in there, but there are some strategies that one is called a project tuning protocol mm -hmm. that really um, is a collaborative effort to design a learning experience for students that have all of these components. And um, one of the strategies is to make sure that all teachers have an opportunity to be using that to gain the results. Okay. Okay. Um, goal six, uh, students will be fully present for learning and stewards of their personal wellness by, sus by a sustained focus on eliminating the obstacles to drug and alcohol misuse in the school environment. Um, we have some data to suggest that, that we, we have some challenges related to drug and alcohol misuse in the student environment and we uh, feel it's very important that we take this head on. Um, and so that when our, when our students come to school, they, that this is a purposeful place for important work and that, that any kind of drug and alcohol misuse gets in the way of us doing really important work. So that's goal six. Um, some strategies there. Goal seven is to cultivate a sense of trust, transparency, and inclusion across all member towns and stakeholder groups. Um, and one of the things that um, that we think will help with that, one of the um, is to produce a district-wide annual report that's mailed to residents and businesses in all district communities. Uh, Paige, you referenced this, that we are getting really proactive about letting our communities know the work that we're doing um, and what the, the outcomes are that we are experiencing. Um, and then foundational systems to coordinate, simplify, routinize the systems in each of our buildings and the district as a whole so that operations are transparent and user friendly. Um, we, we still definitely have work to do on that. So being sure that, um, that we'll allow the digital completion of student demographic and medical forms. We've heard from parents that that's a, a lengthy and cumbersome task, so can we get that cleaned up? The website, getting that developed, an online registration system, and the org chart, you'll see that reference there. Um, And last goal is related to yeah, again foundational systems. Um, and here, this is that idea about you know is having having the school help this to be a destination place, right? So um, may, first of all, naming and branding the district, so we don't keep having the weak cut uh, conversation. So that's what you know, an early on one. Uh, establish an endowment to simplify and encourage donations to the district. Design and implement a high quality teacher recruitment, orientation, and mentoring program. And become a destination for regional and national level professional learning experiences. So there's a, the, the other foundational system is what do we need to do to help this <coughs> educational system um, encourage and, and um, attract people here in the district? we have there um, and I know we, we, we're way past our time so I want to be mindful of that any thoughts feedback here okay. um, on, on six uh, and obviously the, the part of the obstacles of drug and alcohol misuse are huge but it seems like there's a piece for me missing there stewards of their personal wellness and then it goes right to drugs and alcohol, and it seems like <coughs> they don't address the other parts of personal wellness, the other mental health part, I parts yeah, maybe there? Part of that, I just, and I know that um, we refer to the youth risk behavior data. The data around personal wellness is really high. Students self-report, connection to community, connection to parents, connection to educators. So we really felt that the data really focuses <coughs> in when you look at it compared to the state and nationally. This is really where we're falling apart. The cell wellness, participation in activities, all the other indicators that are, are, are part of the youth risk behavior survey really show us to have a really strong presence in that way. 
The data really, though, also highlights that it's really around drug and alcohol. Drug and alcohol. I think we also do have a pretty high rate of depression and suicidal ideation. So I think that that's important to add the mental health piece. I, what, where we're really strong is nutrition, physical activity, and feeling like you have an adult in your life who you can turn to. But our mental health scores are not great either. Which I think there's some self-medicating going on too, right? Um, when you well, think about your substances. Sorry? They tell you that. So I think that I, I like the idea of highlighting and again I think some of these other pieces are really powerful tools to improve some of that sort of naturally mm -hmm. just by making the educational environment a little more engaging. Yes. Sam, um, what, uh, for the uh, personal wellness, uh, I agree mental health is really important, drug and alcohol. What about where do we uh, lie with um, sexual education and like cases of teenage pregnancy and uh, STDs? Where do, what, do we have data on that? We do. Um, in the, is it, that's in the U.S. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I have. Did it. I miss that when I came? Um, no, I was just emphasizing that I didn't, I didn't go through everything. Um, I don't, tomorrow, tomorrow I don't recall well that as being something that was and, and on <coughs> seven I think there's a pretty high rate of sexual activity happening. under the influence. Okay. Um, but I don't remember that state. I don't have all of the data in front of me because it's like 100 pages. Um, but um, it's part of the work that we do, we have a coordinated school health team yeah. that we meet annually and we use the CDC modules to assess ourselves in terms of all those areas. We're just finishing the module around counseling and <coughs> um, health education. So we have been doing work in that and really making some strong progress that you saw that, that policy that we developed on nutrition was part yeah. of the work of this coordinated school health team. And um, I think the wellness, there's a whole new wellness yep. curriculum. I don't know if you, well, because Joseph's young person, you probably don't know that. But Starting in seventh, well, they started in ninth grade, grade, like grade and they started <coughs> the in the like yeah, HD but they didn't have that months. before in middle and high school, except for I think a quarter or a semester class. And now seventh, eighth, ninth is a full year of wellness for each grade. So I do think they're diving okay. more deeply, just because I've talked to the teachers about it. Yeah, I just I asked because it wasn't mentioned in any yeah. of these. Well, and so that's a lot of the work we have. Like, so we just I wrote a grant. And we're just looking for a district wide health curriculum looking at models for implementation of a health curriculum. So some of that's work that's already going, but it may not be reflected in this plan. Um, yeah, I just want to, I guess, return to what Patty was saying. And I mean, and maybe it's already answered by, the, by your statement that this is still in development. But I, I agree that there should be, even if, even if just, just wide the numbers show that we're doing really well with um, nutrition and <coughs> physical activity, there still, still are a lot of people who could benefit from that education and that aren't, aren't getting that. And so I would hope that we continue, especially because it, it dovetails with our uh, nutrition and wellness policy, um, that we continue to focus on, on those issues in the wellness as well, and also the, uh, the things that Sam just brought up. Yeah. Uh, um, so on uh, number nine, I really like the idea of, you know, of creating a strong school district that attracts people and brings people here, but I think I just have to be realistic that what brings people to Vermont or is what we need to bring people to Vermont is jobs. People are not going to move just based. They don't. Most people don't have the resources to move just based on school, right? So, with number nine, I'd like to see components of it. Of how are we integrating that with local town boards, with politicians, legislators, jobs, companies? About how are we making this a realistic uh, endeavor that we, as a school district, can't just do this? We're not going to bring you know reinvent Vermont as the destination, but that. How are we not working parallel to each other, but actually coming together? So partnership, partnership. partnering with other like select boards and that kind of and, thing. And you know, having these conversations with the stakeholders, like the legislators that vote about you know the tax structure in our state and all these things that do and don't bring business to this state versus across the river in New Hampshire. So it's 
getting late, <laughs> and I would just like to wrap this up, Bob. Uh, one more question. Go. <laughs> did I miss it? Did you cover learning environment, or did you? Learning environment, I had up there, basic. but I had a okay. big sign that said basics. I missed it. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, there, there is, that's the, the, the fifth bucket of this plan, but it's a it's a big one to unpack, so it gets okay. its own meeting. <laughs> okay. All right, can I just say one, one thing? Just other than nine, I just feel like the establishing that Dowling Foundation is just like a no-brainer, considering how much money is in this area. So just to wrap it up, I just want to clarify that this page is really the goals that we are setting out as a board to attain, and each little box describes what that goal is. And and Mary Beth tonight has described what her strategies are to support those goals. Um, so we did get a little bit into the weeds tonight. <laughs> as she doesn't want us to, but she invited us tonight to get into the weeds. But I want you to keep that in mind. I also th think that as we move forward, that we can also start looking at, you know, these strategies and a timeline, because it's a five-year plan. And, you know, if we are going to start setting the accountability process, we also need to know when are they going to be accountable? When when are they going to start achieving some of these goals each year? And um, I think that it would be good for Jennifer and I to work with the team in saying, now let's break out these strategies and look at it from year to year for the next five years. And how does that break out? So that when we sit down as a full team to decide on accountability and how do we look at have they succeeded or have they not succeeded? Have they actually implemented the goal like they said they were? You know, <coughs> what's going on? We can also put together our timeline of reporting back from them to us on did they meet those goals or didn't they meet those goals? Um, so I think that probably will be our next little project together so that we can present it to the full board at the retreat, um, if that makes sense to you. Can I have a motion to go into executive session, please? So moved. Thank you. For a while. Second. For a while. Second. Uh, Personnel. Uh, no, actually, it's student matter. Student, student matter. matter. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right. <coughs>